It is great to be with you once again, and I am especially excited about today, not just because it's Senior Sunday. I have a daughter who's a senior this, this year as well, and so, uh, you know, this is an exciting time, right? Life transition, about to go brave the, the, the world that you haven't known before, about to go off to college. These are exciting times, and to all these seniors, I want to commend you for your hard work. I'm excited for you. Uh, I'll say it just like I said to my daughter, we believe in you, and we believe what God can do in and through your life. So you're about to uh, kind of leave the nest, so to speak, and uh, face and brave a, a brand new world, and in many ways, uh, a strange world, uh, but that's part of the fun, right? To go to places you've never been to adventure, go into an adventure that you've never been a part of. And so I just want to let you know that uh, we're praying for you. We believe in you. And uh, I know this church family is going to be praying for you and cheering you on as you go into your next steps. These are strange days. Uh, some of you have been asking, how are you and how is OBU? OBU is doing very well. Uh, we have about a 12 to 24 month overall recovery, but um, I'm very happy to tell you that we are back in classes on campus. We had a big community party yesterday. Uh, we had live music. We were able to do one of our shows. You know, every year we do a show where we have students who do performances. And so, uh, obviously, because of tornado, things were, uh, had to be shifted a little bit. Uh, but we were able to do that in the lawn yesterday outside um, our stadium, and uh, it, was, it was absolutely a blast. So we had a, a few hundred uh, people there uh, playing games, listening to live music, and it was just such a good reminder that God can renew even broken things, and that's what I've experienced in the past couple of weeks and I just want to encourage you, that's what we can experience as well. And in fact, that's where we are in the book of Joel. We've seen in the early half of the book words of judgment, but now we're in the part of the book that emphasizes restoration and renewal. And in fact, we're in the second section today in Joel 2, 28 to 32, that focuses on uh, a promise of restoration. But... Before I get there, um, I, I do want to invite you. We do have an OBU alumni friend, prospective student luncheon, if you want to come. It's immediately after the second service. I believe it's in the choir room. And I don't know, we usually have really good things to eat there and some fun things to uh, take away. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what all is going to be there for you, but I'll be there. And I'd love to talk with you about what God's doing on Bison Hill. So if you're a prospective student or an alumni uh, or a friend or just an interested party, or maybe you just want a free lunch, that's fine too. Uh, you can come. I'll see you there. All right. I've said that, Joel, uh, that we're in this section of renewal. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about renewal. Renewal is when something that is dilapidated or something that is old or tired or something that is uh, about to die or maybe even dead has come back to life. It's renewed. Well, that's what we're talking about in Joel. The title of today's message is A Call That Saves. Now, I am a uh, weird history buff. My periods of history that I like to study may seem strange to some, okay? I like ancient history. By ancient history, let me be very clear what I mean. Uh, I like ancient history 5,000 years ago to about mm, 300 BC, right? So that's kind of a wide range of ancient history. But then I also am a history buff on World War Two history. Anybody World War II historians like to read on World War II? Well, let me get that a little bit more specific. I like to study the life and times of one of World War II's major leaders, Winston Churchill, the British Bulldog, right? You know Winston Churchill chomping on a cigar. He uh, was quite a character. He would spend... Uh, he would spend a lot of the morning in bed 
with, uh, you know, various things, including the cigar. And uh, he would dictate all these memos. But he was so eccentric, but also so beloved. And one of the things that uh, we know about Winston Churchill is in the time of his uh, prime ministership, one of the things that he did is he would make uh, regular calls, especially in the early days when Britain was engaged in war with Germany. He would make regular calls to our U.S. President Roosevelt. And he would call and he would call. And for a long time, uh, it was a different political world back then in, in American politics. Uh, America really didn't want to get involved in the, first, in the Second World War. They didn't want to get involved at all. And so Churchill, using all of his rhetorical skill, would try to convince Roosevelt and America that it was in their interest to get involved in the war. And he would call from the cabinet war rooms in London. He would call, and he would call, and he would call. And Roosevelt was kind and would say all the right things, like, we're with you, buddy. He didn't say buddy. We're with you, Mr. Churchill. In very politician speak, he would say, you know, all of our heart is for the British people, right, and all those things. But there was a turning point. And the turning point happened after the attack on Pearl Harbor when Churchill made a call. And he said, you know, Mr. Roosevelt, I'm so sorry to hear about the terrible attack. And at that point, all of the calls that had gone before that were ineffective, that call was a call that saved. Why? Once America got into the war, and you can see this in Churchill's uh, writings, here's the reality. He knew once America got into the war, war, Essentially, the Allied forces would be victorious. And sure enough, they were. That call after Pearl Harbor, Harbor was a call that saved. Why? America was the great sleeping giant. Reticent to get into war, but once they got into war, it was the end game. I want to talk about a call that saves. And I'm not talking about a call that saves in a world war. I'm going to talk about a call that saves in the war for your soul and for mine. And Joel opens us up to the call that saves. So if you have your Bible, turn to Joel chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 28 and go all the way to the end of the chapter to verse 32. So the text reads this. After this... I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams and your young men will see visions. I will even pour out my spirit on male and female slaves in those days. I will display wonders in the heavens and on the earth Blood, fire, columns of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Press pause. Once again, we have this emphasis in the book of Joel about the, the day of the Lord. And as I've said, the day of the Lord is an event where God reveals himself in judgment and or salvation for Israel and or the nations in accordance with the justice and the mercy of God. So we're talking about here a big time day of the Lord where God reveals himself in both judgment and salvation. For who? Well, we'll talk about that, okay? But this day of the Lord is kind of like what we saw in chapter 1. The day of the Lord comes with cosmic events. Here, we have uh, cosmic upheaval, right? The sun's darkened, the moon, blood red, 
It looks like everything is topsy-turvy. So there's cosmic phenomena with the day of the Lord. Verse 32, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For there will be in uh, for, for there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem as the Lord promised amongst the survivors that the Lord calls. This passage helps us understand a call that saves. Now, I just want to offer two reflections from this passage and then bring it home to us, okay? So what I'd like for you to do is hang on with me. First reflection that we see from this passage of Scripture is quite simply this. And it may not seem immediately obvious, but I want you to walk through this with me. First thing we see in this passage, listen to me, is God wants us to experience him. God wants us to experience him. Now, how many of you live by a calendar? Anybody? Let me see some hands. Anybody live by a calendar? I do. In fact, I've got mine pulled up right here. Uh, my calendar is full from about 6.30 until about 8.30 because it's a heavy time right now. Not 6.30 in the morning to 8.30 in the morning. That would be a good day. <laughs> right? These are long days. My days are filled according to a calendar. I have a lot of events on the, that calendar. And sometimes if you live by a calendar and students, you're about to go to college or you're about to go into the workforce, you'll find out very quickly, it's a little bit different than high school. You're living according to a calendar that's really imposed on you in a way that's never been imposed before. And so you have, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes at this time, this time, and this time. You get Tuesday, Thursday classes. You might not have night classes. Some of you are working, you have a work schedule that you've got to live by. And sometimes when we live according to our calendars, we move from events to events to events to events, and we're grinding down into powder. Events. I'm tired of events. I don't like events. In fact, I was telling our, our student government leadership uh, at early last year, I said, you know, we've got a lot of events going on at OBU. I'm tired of events. Aren't you tired of events? Just going from thing to thing? My goodness, events. What we need to move from is from events to experiences. Why? Because an event doesn't change your life. Events beat us down, but an experience. Well, an experience can change your life. I remember the first time I went trout fishing with my dad. You know, I had been fishing before. Lake uh, Ray Hubbard and all sorts of uh, lakes in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It was fine. I got some bubble gum out of it. It was good. Yeah, I like it. Outdoors, yay. But when I went trout fishing for the first time in the Smoky Mountains... Hiking through the mountains, climbing on rocks, seeing copperhead snakes, not getting bit by them. I remember the first time, you know, I was, I was fishing and I saw a black bear. First of all, that's scary. But you know how I know it wasn't just an event on the calendar of my young life? I still trout fish today. In fact, in a little while, I have planned and God willing, I'll be able to do it. Take my boys after the semester to go trout fishing, and they love to do it too. We're going to go back to the Smokies. So an experience changes your life. Now listen to me. What God desires for you and me is not an event on the calendar. God wants for you and me to experience him. You say, what? How do you know? Because the Bible tells me so. Check this out. In Joel 2, 28 to 32, 
God points to the fact that he doesn't want us to just have an, an, a, a time like at a worship service or something like that where uh, we kind of experience something and sing some songs. No, he wants us to encounter and experience him so our lives are fundamentally changed. Why? Because did you notice in verse 28 what happens? Look at this. What does it say? After this, I will pour out my spirit. And when the spirit comes, God's people who have this spirit encounter, guess what's going to happen? They are going to prophesy. The spirit is the empowering presence that God gives to his people so that they may know him. When we look at Joel 2, 28 to 29, we see that this text has some kind of connection using similar language to other prophetic texts, like in Isaiah and Ezekiel. Here's the difference between Isaiah's use of the Spirit and uh, Ezekiel's use of the Spirit. In Joel, what we've got here was when the Spirit comes, God's people are gifted to prophesy. Prophesy. So like in Isaiah, this is interesting. In Isaiah, when the Spirit comes, God's people are enabled to, you know, follow his commands and follow his words, divine instruction. This is Isaiah 59, 21. In Ezekiel 36, God's Spirit is poured out so that God's people can follow God's judgments and statutes. In Ezekiel 37, when the Spirit comes, God gives life to his people. But in Joel, when the Spirit is poured out, God's people actually speak God's word like prophets. The Spirit in Joel 2, 28 to 29 enables God's people to do the work of prophecy. And what does that actually mean? What does it mean when you see like Joel and these other prophets prophesy? Deborah, there's a lot of prophets and prophetesses in the Old Testament. It means that God enables his, his people to experience him, listen to this, Personally, you know who's the consummate prophet in the Old Testament? Moses. And you know what the Bible says about Moses? Moses saw God face to face. Abraham's called a prophet. Do you know what Abraham experienced? Well, the, the book of James tells us that Abraham was a friend of God. Who's your best friend? Who's your closest friend? What do you do with your friend? When you get into a tough time, what do you do? You call him. Who's your closest friend? You laugh together, you cry together, you do stuff together, you have a lot of fun together, you confide in one another. Abraham, the consummate prophet in the Old Testament with Moses, is called a friend of God. Know God personally. Experience him personally. To hear his voice like a friend. And then speak God's word to those who need to hear it. That's what prophets do. So when you think about experiencing God, it's not just having an emotional experience. It's hearing God's word like a friend as he gives you guidance and direction in life. As he reveals truth so that then you can live it but also proclaim it. So this outpouring of the Spirit described in Joel is powerful because it's personal. It's experiential. It's intimate. It's real. And then God empowers us to speak his word to those who need to hear it. And this is an interesting... Uh, reality in the book of Joel. Now, in the book of Joel, you'll notice that uh, it's God's representatives who speak God's word. In chapter one, we saw this. Do you remember this? In chapter one, when God's people cry out, it's the priests who go before the people and they lead the people in crying out to God. So the priests are the one speaking the word of God. Did you see that? 
in penitence. They're going to the temple and they're saying on behalf of the people and leading the people, hey God, this is what's going on. The priests. They repent at the temple with the priests. The people do at the, at, at, with the priests at the lead. They repent at the temple and the, the, the priests are at the front of the procession. But check this out. That form of worship is hierarchical. Did you see that? The priests are at the head. The priests are doing all the talking. What's interesting here is when the spirit of God is poured out, this is a huge contrast to what we've seen before. When God's spirit comes upon all people here in Joel 2, 28 to 32, there's no hierarchy. All people are imbued with the spirit of God and the gift of prophecy and vision from the Lord. This picture, let me just say, accords with the New Testament image of God's people becoming the spiritual house. The temple. What does the text say? After this, I will pour out my spirit on who? The rich. No, that's not what it says. I know the good looking. No, that's not what it says. Oh, I know the priests and the most holy people. That's not what it says. It says that I will pour out, this is God speaking, my spirit on all humanity. Some of your versions say all flesh. And when he does this, your sons and your daughters, I know who will uh, uh, speak God's word and receive the spirit. I know it's only going to be, you know, the spiritually mature and not the young. No, young. Here, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. Seeing visions, having dreams, speaking words of God. That is the function, definition of prophecy. An intimate relationship with God where, wherein he encounters you and you experience him and then all of a sudden you're proclaiming God's word. You're gaining insight you didn't have before. This is the outpouring of the spirit. This is a renewal. I even like this idea that uh, it's unbelievable and it's hard sometimes when we read verse 29. I will pour out my spirit on the male and female slaves in those days. You might say, well, I don't like that slavery in the Bible stuff. Right. Read the book of Philemon, you'll see. There's a progression out of it. You know, that's the way that works. But do you know, there's something about this uh, male and female slaves. These could be indentured servants uh, of, who are fellow Israelites, but it also could be uh, captured slaves who are non-Israelites in the midst of Israel. And if that's the case, then non Israelites, you call these Gentiles in the New Testament, non-Israelites also receive the gift of prophecy, the experience with God. Israelites, non-Israelites, Jews, Gentiles, God wants all to experience him. Now, if that's true, my friends, it points to this fact that God doesn't just want some to know and experience him. He wants all to come and know to experience him. The Spirit reveals the truth that God wants us to experience him intimately, personally. Like prophets, we hear God's voice, speak God's word. This is... God's desire, not just for a few, it's for you and for me, least to the greatest, young, old, able-bodied, and those with disabilities. Different backgrounds, different social classes, different ethnicities. God wants to pour out his spirit on all humanity. Sometimes we think that God really wants to know some of us, the good, the perfect, the nice, only those who go to church. Joel 2 reminds us that God, because he loves us, wants to pour out his spirit on all. Some of us might think, well, God doesn't really need me. He just wants to bless the needy, the poor, those in need, maybe in other lands. 
But that's not the picture that we get here. God wants you to experience him. God wants me to experience him because of the radical love of God. This phrase, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, all humanity, upon male and female slaves, indicates that God is no respecter of persons. He loves, and he wants to pour out his spirit. And what is the spirit? Why the spirit? The spirit empowers us to hear God's voice, to know God, to discern truth from error, and to speak God's word with power. See, God wants all to experience him. I think about this radical transformation that comes from experiencing God. And I think about one of our students who experienced God in a special way this, uh, this past semester. She grew up in church. And she was actually one of our volleyball players, unbelievable athlete, very tall. Uh, and she's also an artist, singer, um, unbelievable. But like many of us, you know, she might have grown up in church and she was just kind of wandering around, going from this relationship to that relationship. God was kind of a feature in her life, but not really personal, experiential. And what happened in a revival, you know, a couple of weeks after the Asbury revival, when God began to move on our campus and we saw lives changed and we saw worship unleashed and we saw the Lord getting hold of people and they were responding, students were responding and we had worship services that lasted hours and hours in the uh, in the the hours of the class and the hours of the day, but also deep into the night. This student told her mother, and she was a little bit skeptical on church because of some of the pain and some of the uh, things that she had experienced um, as she kind of rebelled against the Lord. She's just skeptical. But she told her mother, I don't know what's going on at OBU, but something's happening to me. God's getting hold of me. And what happened, I don't know how else to explain it, she experienced God. And her life was changed. A few days after the revival, uh, she gave a testimony in chapel and she said, those of you who knew me before, if you uh, told me that I would be speaking in chapel about what God's done in my life, nobody would have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it. But this is her testimony. I don't know how to tell you this, but I am transformed. Amen. How does that happen? When we experience God. When we hear the call of God on our life. My friends, when we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ, he gives us his spirit. We hear his voice like a friend, and our lives are changed. Our tongues are loosed, our eyes are opened, our heart is warmed and we speak the word of God from the heart. So let me ask you a basic question this morning. Students, from this end of the room all the way back there, have you experienced God? You say, well, I mean, I think so, I don't know. Well, I have good news for you. Because this leads us to our second reflection. How do you experience God? This gets us to the call that saves. After this outpouring of the Spirit, this point about God's Spirit being poured out, 
we find out how that happens. Look at it. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem as the Lord promised amongst the survivors the Lord calls. You see, when the day of the Lord comes, and that's what it's talking about, where God comes to judge the living and the dead. Who's going to survive? Those who call on God's name. When we call on the name of the Lord, we are asking God for help, deliverance, instead of other sources we think will help. God's very name, call on the name of the Lord. God's very name ensures deliverance and help because that's who God is. He is the deliverer. He is the savior. He is the Lord. And no other name can save. Only his name can save. How do we call or who do we call in times of trouble? I tend to call my dad. My dad's one of my heroes. In times of trouble, I call my dad. That's good. I have some friends that I call in times of trouble. I have a mentor that I call in times of trouble. And when I call their names and I say, Dad, I need help. Jay, I need help. Matt, I need help. Guess what happens? I get good advice. I get somebody to pray for me. But my father, my family, my mentor, and my friend can't save me. There's only one name that can save. There's only one name that can hold life and death. There's only one name that can preserve my life. Now, but also for eternity. The very name of God. Who is the name of the name? What is the name of the Lord? Who is this person that I'm talking about? Well, in the book of Acts, those who call on the name of the Lord for salvation call on the name of Jesus, believing his salvation. We know this because, you know, when uh, in the book of Acts, after Jesus is ascended, uh, one of Jesus' followers, a rough guy named Peter, he starts preaching. They're at the temple, and all of a sudden, this weird spirit thing happens where tongues of fire appear, and everybody's talking, and there's all these different nations and tribes and languages speaking, but because of these tongues of fire, somehow everybody's able to hear the word of the Lord. It's an unbelievable outpouring of prophecy, and in that moment, some of the uh, people who are a little skeptical say, everybody's drunk. What's going on? Muttering around, what's going on? Peter jumps in. Verse 14 of chapter 2, and he says, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people aren't drunk, as you suppose, since it's only 9 in the morning. If they're drunk at 9 in the morning, they've got a problem, right? On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And then he quotes our passage. He says, and it will be in these last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy, and I will display wonders in the heaven above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name... Of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, signs, and God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's judgment, God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to the cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. And then this is what he says. After he talks about Jesus and what Jesus did, he says, you need to call on Jesus' name for salvation. There's only one name that is able to ultimately save you. And it's not the name of a university. 
It's not the name of a profession or a job. It's not the name of a friend or a family member. There's only one name that will be your, and look at what Joel says, escape. Escape from judgment. And that's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. And we are in the time right now where we have the opportunity to call on the name of Jesus. And when we do, guess what happens? The Spirit comes, and we experience God. And it's not just for the religious few. It's not just for me who's preaching this morning. It's for you. So you can know God like a friend. There's only one name that saves. We can call on Jesus' name. Do you know him? Have you called on the name that saves? It's the name of Jesus. When we do, my friends, we can have the experience of one of our students. Life transformation. Light behind the eyes rather than when you wake up, it's just the the worst doldrum. Oh, another day. It doesn't have to be that way. You can break addictions. You can find purpose and meaning. You can find forgiveness of sins if you call on his name.